All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Megan, and I will be your Waterloo Public Library host tonight. We are here for Bold Business with KW Headshots. Uh, this is a new par uh, program from Waterloo Public Library in partnership with the Uptown Waterloo Business Improvement Area. And we're going to hear from Hannah Marie very shortly, but we will do some introductions and housekeeping first. So on the agenda tonight, uh, we are going to start with a land acknowledgement. We'll have introductions. Then you'll have a conversation with Hannah Marie and Tracy uh, of the Uptown Waterloo BIA. Uh, then there will be a brief question and answer period where you can ask some questions of Hannah and Tracy. And the last portion of the program tonight is where we're going to learn about Simply Analytics, which is a free library tool uh, which can help you with your own business. And uh, we are really lucky tonight. Hannah is giving away uh, an express headshot session to one lucky participant. So we'll announce that winner um, at the end of Hannah's uh, interview. So we acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and neutral people. Waterloo Public Library is situated on the Haldeman track, which is landed that was promised to the Six Nations and includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. To give some context to that acknowledgement, I'd like to share some information about a member of our Canadian Indigenous community, David Robertson. Uh, David A. Robertson is a well-respected author of books for all ages and a member of Norway House Cree Nation and currently lives in Winnipeg. While he is not from this region, I wanted to highlight his works as there have been attempts to ban his book, The Great Bear, from some Ontario classrooms this month. The Barren Grounds, the first book in the middle grade Misawa Saga series, was shortlisted for the Ontario Library Association's Silver Birch Award and was a finalist for the 2020 Governor General's Literary Award. And his memoir, Blackwater Family, Legacy, and Blood Memory, won the Alexander Kennedy Award for Nonfiction, as well as the Carol Shields Winnipeg Book Award at the 2020 Manitoba Book Awards. That's a little context to our land acknowledgement. But let's hear from tonight's speakers. So tonight we have Tracy Van Cowlsbeek. And Tracy joined the Uptown Waterloo Business Improvement Area as Executive Director in April 2018, after three and a half years as the Executive Director at the Stratford Perth Community Foundation. She was previously a Project Manager for Manulife's Philanthropy and Sponsorships team, Manager of Marketing and Communications at the Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation, and Program Manager for Junior Achievement. Tracy is an avid volunteer, and some of her current positions include Trust and Council Member of the Royal Highland Fusiliers, Member of Oktoberfest Advisory Committee, Member of the Torstar Advisory Council, Grant Committee Member for the Ontario Trillium F Foundation, and Board Member and Chair of Waterloo Regional Tourism Marketing Corporation. And of course, we also have Hannah Marie, who is the owner of KW Headshots. Born and raised in Waterloo, Hannah Marie is the owner of KW Headshots, and she is an expert when it comes to helping people feel comfortable. Her magic touch means her customers walk away with a headshot they love, ready to tackle new opportunities. Hannah Marie has taught the business of photography to 4,800 plus photographers across North America. In 2019, Hannah started KW Headshots, a niche business which has become the region's premier headshot studio, delivering 50 to 80 headshots weekly. Welcome, Tracy and Hannah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Megan. Uh, to start with Hannah, what do you think of my headshot in the picture today? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I maybe need a little bit of uh, inspiration, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we're going to start talking about you, not about me. So <laughs> to kick things off for everybody today, Hannah, can you tell us a little bit about what your career aspirations were, what they were as you were growing up? When I was growing up, well, yeah. um, 
oh, I don't know, anything from like being a cheerleader <laughs> to being on Broadway. Um, I was totally an arts kid growing up through and through. Um, I took business just because it was required, I think. But yeah, career aspirations, I think it was always about connecting with people in some way and making a difference in some way too. Um, I think those were the two big things for me. Cool. And so you've touched on a few and definitely mm -hmm. it seems like you've been bit by the entrepreneurism, entrepreneurialism, sorry, uh, bug. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about why that fits you so well? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't know why it fits me so well. I mean, I know now, but as a youth growing up, it certainly wouldn't have been anything that I would have thought. I wasn't, I wasn't really into math or being organized. Um, in fact, I actually have ADD. And so I think a lot of people think that people with ADD always function on the side of like everything's disorganized and crazy and hectic. Mm. But the truth is that like, it's either that or it's hyper organized. My, my hands are like glowing. <laughs> Hence my ADD kicking in. <laughs> I'm trying to find like, oh, there we go. I'll sit back out of the sun. <laughs> yeah. So you're either like completely disorganized or you're like hyper anally organized. And the thing with people with ADD is that you can't function in the middle. So you're one or the other. So, um, I think as soon as I learned that, that like I need to just remain like really, really organized, that really helped me understand um, how I can function more, more uh, efficiently in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think I've always just had big dreams and big plans. And I have something in the works right now that I might not mention tonight, but uh -oh. it's a little quiet, um, but it's really exciting. And on the, on the trajectory of headshots still, just on a bigger scale. Yeah. Um, yeah. So going into entrepreneurialism, I, my dad owned a, a business when I was growing up. Um, he's a local architect. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that also helped me see like that side of things of, you know, seeing someone step out on their own and make that happen. I don't that know. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, and you think of too, when uh, people are looking to get back to their community or donate a lot of times that's a learned behavior too from their family. So that, that totally makes sense for sure. Mm -hmm. Anna. Um, can you talk about something that you wish that you knew before you started your own business? Yeah. Like regarding business. Yeah. Just your personal yeah. experience. It's kind of like you telling your story. Yeah. Well, you know, um, one of the things that we've talked about in the marketing of, of this event tonight is niching down. And I always heard successful photographers and business people saying that, that like, you have to niche, you have to niche. And it can take a while to figure that out. So um, for me, I like the first six years, I kind of shot anything and everything. I was totally that starving artist, <laughs> that classic starving artist photographer and staying up all night editing. And um, when I did try to niche the first time, it was in high-end weddings. And in that, I thought that when I got like the higher end weddings, I'd like it even more than I did just shooting normal weddings because I did really enjoy that. But I still just liked it the same. And then I realized what I loved about weddings was actually the family coming together. And when I realized that, I decided to shift away from weddings completely and move on to like family portraits and working with kids and families and telling those stories over generations. Um, and then I, I just thought, you know, if I had just a headshot website, what would that look like? And how many inquiries would I get more than just like a little tab on a website? And I think when niching down, it's not just about the style of what you're shooting, the niche that you're shooting, but the business structure within that. So I kind of wish that I had learned the business structure of headshots a long time ago because it really fits my brain again like with the ADD and I can just like focus on one client they're in my studio I should photograph them they get to choose their headshot right away I edit it right away send it back and then the job's done and the next person arrives whereas families it's like you're managing many projects at once and there's just always um things to edit or products to order things like that so yeah I think niching down would definitely be one of them and learning how to 
uh, market yourself and marketing messaging. That's something that I love even now. Um, but I think without that, you can't really market your company as well as you could. Yeah, for sure. And we're going to talk about marketing in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? But you know, you mm -hmm. wouldn't have got to where you are today without going through all of that process yeah. and, and uh, figuring out what uh, what resonated best with you. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about something that you tried that maybe you failed at, and maybe what you know what you learned to do differently? Well, I would say wedding photography, and not, again, not in terms of um the style like I, I can shoot a beautiful wedding but the business structure of it and I see this still with so many photographers that they feel like they have to do everything themselves um and so for me I got really behind on my editing with weddings and at that time and that age I won't say how long it was ago but more than 10 years ago um there weren't editing companies out there um so and we had like a huge, like three huge family tragedies within like six months of each other, like in my second year of business. And so trying to like manage that and like come through the grief of those three things while start like running a new business, I got really behind on my editing tough. and didn't know how to communicate with my clients about it because it was just like tragedy after tragedy. And it's like, okay, well, at what point are they just going to think like, is this really happening? Um, so I think with that, what I learned is first of all, to have a structure in place in the case of a scenario of an emergency so that you have an email you can just send out to all of your clients who need to know. Um, you don't have to write it, it's already written and just having a game plan in place in case of that. And also again, learning which structure works best for me and knowing like if you were to get behind in all of that, there are editors out there that you can outsource to. Um, so if anybody in here is a wedding photographer who's always behind, I'd totally recommend getting an editor. That makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I would imagine in doing your role that it's probably tough to create boundaries around your personal and professional life. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you might be able to do that or how you have been able to do that? Or maybe you haven't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can ask my husband that. Um, I tend to be pretty good with it. Like at this point, um, because headshots are more business centric, I can operate between nine and five, but I do still have people who request evenings or weekends. And in that scenario, I just charge them another hundred dollars because if they're willing to pay, if they're not willing to pay another hundred for that time slot, then I'm not willing to give it up from my family time. And I would only try to do that like once a, once a month kind of a thing, but the boundaries, um, especially as like a solopreneur because it isn't just like the shooting and the editing. It's also the marketing and the website upkeep yep. and all of that, the book. Well, I have an accountant, but like all of, all of the things that go into running a business. And so um, the administrative side of things, always yeah. the fun part of. A yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And running social media and all of that. Um, it can yeah. be a lot, but I think it is really important to just like stop to learn to learn how to stop what you're doing and know that you can just pick it up again the next day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the best part of what you do? What do you love the most? Mm, and you I can't love, say everything. Yeah, no, I won't <laughs> say everything. Cause I don't, love, I mean, I do like a lot of it, but um, again, the connecting with people every single day, like today I had a full, full day with new people coming in every half hour and just the diversity in that, like all the different careers that are walking through the door and the people that I get to meet, but also like of everyone that comes through, probably 85% or 90%. If I could see everybody right now, I'd pull the room and it would probably be almost everybody hates having their photos taken. <laughs> Nobody likes having their picture taken and especially headshots, like families and weddings. Like you at least have other people to engage with in front of the camera and you're not alone. Like mm -hmm. it's more candid, but this is literally like just standing in front of a stranger who's holding a camera and like, trusting that they've got your back so a lot of people come in nervous um some people like their voices are shaking or just really anxious about it and or just not wanting to be there and so to see that transition of like being able to photograph them show them the pictures right away and like see that relief of like oh I actually like really like these and if you read our reviews a lot of people say that that like 
they usually hate or don't like how they look in pictures or they don't feel comfortable in front of the camera, but mm -hmm. we were able to capture them in a way that they, they can really like how they look. And I think that's really special to be able to do. I think it is too, putting people at ease. So you've obviously got some great people skills to go along with everything too, Hannah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. We're going to move to a, a chatting with you a little bit about the timeline of your business. Can you talk a little bit about how um, it's evolved over time? And I know that I think you've got three different businesses that you've kind of run through this time frame. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, so the first one would have been those first six years. Um, and I was accepting like anything and everything like anniversary parties, product photography for websites. I even did like photographed all of the products at a grocery store for their online store, like anything, weddings, newborns. Um, and in my seventh year, I actually took the year off as a sabbatical. And part of that was that I just needed a year to get caught up on all my editing, get all that stuff returned to the clients who I, had, I really felt like I let them down. And I actually fixed that. I went back and like offered them however much they paid me in their wedding photography. I offered them in product. So if they wanted to order an album or prints or anything through me, I just wanted to make it up to them that way. Um, so in that seventh year, I did that. And then I also studied the business structure of photography and really wanted That's to cool. learn how, okay, so the last six years didn't go how I hoped. How can I make sure that the next seven uh, go really well? And so, and this is actually my next seventh sabbatical year. I'm not taking a sabbatical, but um, it's kind of neat to think about that, that it's now being another seven and I've really liked how it's gone. So in that year, I studied the business of photography and then uh, relaunched as Hannah Marie, Hannah Marie photographer. And under that, that's when I went to the weddings and the high-end families. And within that structure, I really love the idea of especially with family photography like people don't really realize this but little kids can't understand and conceptualize where they fit in a family so a little two-year-old or three-year-old might always see the parents snuggling and hugging their sibling but when they're being hugged and snuggled they can't see it and so they don't receive it the same way so I love photography and putting photos on walls of kids being snuggled and hugged and things like that because then they can see it and they can even see like in the full family portrait like oh here I am and they'll often my clients say like the kids point themselves out when they're walking down the stairs like oh here's me and mommy and here's me and daddy and like they just love it so I love that aspect um that was a big thing about moving towards families is being able to show like the growth of the family over years and then when I decided to shift to headshots it was really about, again, the business structure of just, um, it fits me better and being able to serve the community. I think like if it's serving me really well, it serves the community better because I can really thrive in that. And again, niching down, like I actually took a year um, when I decided to pursue headshots to study again. And I studied posing and lighting because headshots is totally different than family photography and weddings. And it might right. not seem like that, but to really like do an excellent job, it's a lot of posing and like, okay, move your nose like a millimeter this way, just teeny <laughs> tiny tweaks like that. So it's been interesting developing like those brands over the time because um, they do kind of take on a life of their own, but there's also a lot of like intention brought into it. Well, cool. that's, uh, yeah, I never thought about, um, like, when you're talking about the little kids and how they don't see themselves, mm -hmm. they can see other people. And I, it, it's so true. And I have uh, two little grandkids. And I'll tell you, the first thing that they look at when they come over to my house is always where all the pictures are. And they like to point at everybody. And yeah. the youngest one is like a year and a half. And, you know, she's like, Mama, Dada, or whatever, yeah. Gigi. Yeah, it's, it's so true. They love it's it. so cool. Yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hadn't thought about that way. All right, we're going to move on to talking about uh, marketing. You have alluded to the fact that you do do your own marketing. Do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about what your goal was while you were building out these brands and then maybe any tips that, that you might have or uh, things that you want to share around your marketing strategies? Yeah, so goals for the brand. So Hannah Marie, the goal was really to shift it to higher end. And prior to the Hannah Marie brand, it was called Red Umbrella Photography and it was kind of like all encompassing, like we've got you covered no matter what you need, we've got it. Like we can do it. When I switched to Hannah Marie, I made that shift marketing and branding wise because 
I really wanted it to be like, you're hiring an artist, you're commissioning an artist. And if it's a generic name, for all they know, it's like a business owner with a whole bunch of different photographers. But I wanted it to come across as like, you're, you're commissioning an artist to come and create this artwork for you. And um, yeah, exactly. with KW Headshots, and, and Hannah Marie was like very, um, I say was, it it's, is still here, but again, it's not as much of a focus, but it was very much more um, low, low, low volume, high touch boutique. Like each family that came through was like 30 hours of my time. We wow. plan out the whole session in the wardrobe and we take into account the rooms where those portraits are going to hang um, and the space, the size of it. Like if you're having a portrait this size versus a 30 by 40, I'm going to shoot it differently. Right. And we're going to style it differently depending on how formal the room is and what colors are in it. So all of that is taken into account. KW Headshots, on the other hand, is very high volume. So instead of like maybe 24 clients a year, it's like 2,400. <laughs> so totally <laughs> different marketing strategy. Yeah. And the name and the brand came out of just wanting to like, what are people Googling when they need a headshot? I wanted it to be the city name, but Kitchener Waterloo is really long. So I cut it down to KW. And I do sometimes have people be like, so what does KW stand for? <laughs> like, Kitchener Waterloo. <laughs> Where are you from? <laughs> Guess not here, not from Kitchener Waterloo. <laughs> they must be from oh. Cambridge. It's okay. I know. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Sorry to anybody that's from Cambridge. <laughs> it might be on the skull. <laughs> yeah. So I really wanted it to be like accessible. They really don't care who I am. Like for all they know, like they just want to know that they'll like their headshot and that it's very efficient. And with business, um, if you compare my two websites, they actually have the same build out. I built both of my websites myself. Mm -hmm. So it's actually like the duplicate design, but totally different messaging. So on the family side, it's a lot more about like building trust and connecting with the people and making sure like, okay, this person's going to be handling my newborn. Like, do I like her? Do I not? Right. And on my business one, it's very much like, okay, book now, here's the details. Here's how much it is, whatever, like people just want to be able to get through it quickly um, and find the information that they want and book it and have it done. So even for like the families, we have full phone consults and for headshots, it's just like, here's an email of the stuff you need. People don't want to like waste their time with it. It's more about um, being efficient and yeah, letting them kind get of... her done. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you're four years now in Uptown Waterloo in your current mm -hmm. location above my chiropractor. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, did you do any research or planning before you brought your, your business to a brick and mortar location? Mm -hmm. So at that point I was still doing family photography mainly. Um, and yeah, mainly what I did was in this room that I'm sitting in, um, it has like very high ceilings. And so I actually kind of just like moved all the furniture to one side and used this as a studio for a few shoots just to see if I would like it. Mm -hmm. And because when I started out like 13, 14 years ago, I always thought like, oh, I'll never do it. You know, it was coming out of that like 90s glamour shots era. <laughs> and into like the oh, I, will, I won't tell you that I did that back then. <laughs> oh, I did that. <laughs> right and like the 80s and 90s were all about the studio portraits and yeah. so the what do we call it? like the 2000s sure. <laughs> the 2010s like those were all about like the outdoor like lifestyle kind of thing and so that's really when I entered the realm of photography and I always thought like well I'll never have a studio I'll never be that photographer who's like making you point your nose and do this and that but um yeah so when I got the studio it was very much about um, well, I, I actually got it way earlier than I thought I would. I didn't give, I didn't give all that much thought to it, to be honest. I just tried shooting in my house and I loved it. And then I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to like watch what's on the market in terms of rentals, commercial rentals for the next couple of years. And then from there, I'm going to, um, you know, just hop on something when I find it. And the very first day I went on and that space was available and I was like, oh no. It's an uptown <laughs> Waterloo house. though. What a great place. <laughs> yeah, and there's parking, there's free parking yes. on site and it's beautiful and it's accessible. So um, that's really all the thought that went into it. Okay. No, mm -hmm. that's okay. Some people just know when that's they how, know. 
entrepreneurship it's just like oh the opportunity is here let's do it and it just panned out and I'm glad that I did because headshots like I wouldn't be able to do what I do without a studio so right Mm -hmm. okay great so let's think about the pandemic can Mm -hmm. you talk about some changes that you've had to make to your business because of the pandemic that have been positive or any limitations that you faced yeah well I mean I have to wear a mask all day (laughs) And like wipe down be- between every client. So I'd say the main, like the first lockdown, we had to close down completely. Commercial photography was one of the businesses that did not have to close down though after that first lockdown. So in all the lockdowns, we were allowed to be open. However, bookings did drop significantly for every lockdown, especially the corporate, like the big companies booking a lot. So when lockdowns lifted one of the bigger changes is that for companies I used to be able to like have them all in the studio at once kind of pump them all through at once and then show them all their photos at once and because of the pandemic it then turned into like it's literally having to do full express sessions with each of their staff instead of big full sessions within like two hours it would take like all day so that was one big shift um I'd say other than that, there hasn't been much of a difference. Um, When I'm proofing with people, I don't sit beside them. I use my keyboard like on the other side of the room, but it's been pretty, a pretty easy shift I'd say for my business, especially since like, I don't do the events and weddings anymore. I can't even fathom like the headache. If you had been doing the events during that time frame, that would have greatly affected the number of gigs that you got for sure. Yeah. And I know a lot of photographers tried to shift to headshots, like wedding, wedding photographers in particular tried to right. shift to headshots, but because I already had the SEO and the website and the history yeah. and all the reviews, like it really, we actually like grew 78% last year in revenue. So Congrats. we're That's very awesome. fortunate that way um, that it was yeah. set up good timing in terms of like, we were already established for a couple of years before that hit. Yeah, you were thinking ahead. You knew you had the crystal ball knowing that the <laughs> pandemic was coming and you're like, I'm oh going to switch to headshots. <laughs> if I knew the pandemic was coming, I would have called China to tell them to stop it. <laughs> my brother, my brother's family lives in Hong Kong and we haven't, wow. you know, they're still in lockdown. So, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay. So <laughs> we've got uh, maybe another two minutes before we're going to switch over to Q&A. So I'm going to ask you a couple final questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've already talked about, um, how you found your niche in, in head, in headshot. I can't talk today. Your niche in headshot photography. Mm -hmm. I say that five times fast. And I I think it's so interesting how you came to that. Uh, but I want to ask you some fun questions right now before Mm -hmm. we turn it over to the Q and a. So is there a client or a session that stands out to you as a favorite and you know, what, what was it? And then I'm going to ask you one more quick fun question. Oh, a favorite client. I love any clients that love to talk about marketing and business. Oh. <laughs> I think I posted a reel um, on Instagram a couple months ago and it was like someone who came in for a 20 minute appointment and I'll sometimes like with their permission film it on time lapse. And in the time lapse, you can just see us standing there for like 20 minutes, <laughs> 15 minutes. Just talking. Because <laughs> we're just talking and talking and talking. And then I shoot, I think I took like 10 frames of him showed it he loved it and it was done <laughs> uh, that's but great. I just I love to connect with business people so anything like that mm-hmm. yeah well you're in the right market for that given what yeah. you do <laughs> business people need headshots yeah um, any tips for looking your best in photos mm. hire a photographer who knows what they're doing <laughs> I think yeah that's a lot of it um, point your nose towards the camera have the camera slightly above eye level Um, Like right now I'm kind of sitting on the corner of my table because there's a lot of nice natural light coming in the windows, but not like direct light. So if you're on zoom, for example, you can try to be near a window, but not in the sunlight. Um, It depends on the kind of picture. Like if it's a headshot, um, there's a bunch of cues you can do like stand at a 45 degree angle, point your nose to the camera. But if it's like (laughs) candid, then just like, don't worry about it and just be natural and smile and laugh and have fun because that that'll show in the images. Have you seen the movie wine country with like Amy Poehler and that whole gang of SNL people? There's this one scene where they have doing a selfie and they all, the one girl says to all of them, everybody put your head down. 
and they count to three and everybody looks up and it's a natural look. Is that a true thing? <laughs> um, again, it might depend on the industry and what you're doing. Like I could see models if they know their angles, <laughs> maybe doing that. I don't know, but I don't do that with headshots. <laughs> All right. Good to know. And my final question, what's the most, most unique prop that anybody's ever brought or maybe one that you've provided? Oh, for a headshot. Um, yeah. Well, people don't often bring props. That's more for my custom branding sessions, but I've had two in the last year. One brought like, she was a therapist, but she uses a lot of tactile things. And so she brought a whole bunch of little, if you imagine like the balls that are in like ball rooms when you're a kid and you like, like jump a ball, in the ball. a ball pool or a ball pit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she brought a bunch of those and like threw them up in the air. Um, and then we just did it a ton of times and I edited like all the balls into one shot. And then I had just a few months before that, um, a mortgage broker bring her daughter in and she's like five and she brought her all of her own cash, the little girl. And it was all these bills of like fifties and hundreds. And like, just again, like throwing money all up in the air, <laughs> a lot of throwing <laughs> shots. I guess <laughs> mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to be, you know, a golfer throwing golf balls or, you know, anything like that. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, actually, I did have a fellow come in for acting shots. I don't advertise for acting. I do all business, but sometimes actors do come in. And he brought in like a prison jumpsuit to wear as like a character shot. Yeah. Mm. (laughs) Did it belong to him at one point? That would be my question. (laughs) He also brought a tuxedo. So. (laughs) All right. I think with that, Hannah, Hannah, thank you so much for Mm -hmm. uh, answering those questions. I, you know, I know we have some time for some other folks to ask their questions and then we'll move on with the, uh, the rest of the show. Mm. So I think uh, we're turning things back over. Megan and Madison, I think, uh, are going to take us through the questions. Yeah, no, I am. Or you, I am. you can go ahead, Tracy. Okay. Go I for it. Sorry. All right. So Q&A. So put this up. Okay. So Suman is asking Hannah, are there any photography classes that you might recommend? Ah, so what I would recommend, okay, so if you have Facebook, <laughs> I don't really teach photography. I teach, I do, I am a public speaker in, in the photography industry, but I teach more like the business side of it. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I did a Facebook series. If you go to Facebook and search like, hashtag photography with Hannah Marie. Um, I'll type it in the chat here. Mm -hmm. Um, Photography. Maybe I'll do that in a minute. Um, You'll find I did like a 30 or 40 day. Like it was technically a day camp for kids, but it's all the same stuff. Oh, thanks, Megan. Um, All the same content that I would teach any adult. Just like ignore my child voice because, you know, I was speaking to like six year olds. but that would be a really good place to start because in terms of actually using your camera, it's one thing like I, the way I taught this, you could even use an iPhone with it, but I was teaching the kids how to see. So looking for like shapes and shadows, looking for um, even just like shapes, you know, one of the days was like, find a square, find a circle, like find all the shapes that you can find, find different colors. So it was mainly like 40 days of just trying to teach them to be aware of their surroundings and see how I see, because I see light in a way that's different than like a lot of people. Um, So if you can train yourself in that, that can be a good place. And also um, if you look at Creative Live, it's a website. Um, I've spoken on there again, it, it was actually a class on how to organize and automate a better customer experience. However, Creative Live was like created by photographers for photographers, although they've expanded out like Brene Brown has spoken there, like all sorts of people, but they have a lot of photography education too. I think that they have like a monthly plan that you can pay for, or you can just get their app and then you can watch like one lesson a day for free. And that was Creative Live, you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, creativelive.com. All right. Oh, good. Maybe just put that up there too. (laughs) Perfect. Uh, the next question, also from Suman, is wondering what is the best beginner camera that you might recommend? Whatever camera you have. Um, I often have people ask me this, and I don't sell cameras, so I honestly don't know. Um, it would depend on what your priorities are. And like if you want it to be lightweight and something that is portable and you can take places, 
Um, most of the time, like my iPhone camera is really good. So that's often what I use as my main camera these days when I'm not professionally shooting, like if I'm traveling or anything, but um, one option could also be mirrorless. And the nice thing about that is that um, mirrorless is a digital camera. DSLRs are built the same way that film cameras are in the sense that like, it's not a digital image when you're looking through the viewfinder. And when you click it, that's when the DSLR turns it into a digital image. Um, so you don't actually know what your image is gonna look like until you've taken it. A mirrorless camera, when you look through the viewfinder actually looks like a video camera. It's very trippy for me at mm. least because I'm not used to that. Although I'm getting used to it. And so I shoot mirrorless, I have one of each now. But mirrorless is nice because it's much smaller, much more portable, it's lighter. And the second you turn it on, you can see on the viewfinder and through the viewfinder and on the back of the camera exactly what your image is gonna look like. So it can actually be cool that way because you can learn a little more quickly like what settings you need to set it to because um, like if, you, if you're going to be shooting in a darker space and you need like a higher ISO or whatever, then you can see that on the back of the camera because it's too dark and you can just like adjust your settings until it works for you. So there's a lot of acronyms there for people that understand, I think, things <laughs> in the <laughs> photography world. Um, but I'm sure like the DSL you're talking about had something to do with digital something. Digital um, single lens reflex, yeah. Okay, and the mirror That's thing. What, like, so I've learned, I've, I, there's a whole education <laughs> thing going on here. That... Yeah, so there's digital cameras, which are the, the tiny little ones that are just like, the it's all built into one. And then DSLRs are like the camera body and the lens that you can like swap oh, the lenses off okay. and it's still yes. digital, but it's single lens reflex the way that film cameras are. And then mirrorless is just like digital. Yeah. Basically <laughs> go to this tech or somewhere like a camera store and they can help you. <laughs> yeah. They'll give you some good advice. <laughs> Those guys sure. know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and Suman again, um, has a question around a brand recommendation at all for those cameras that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so I shoot Nikon. Um, for mirrorless cameras, to be honest, Nikon is stepping up the game. In terms of lenses, they still have excellent lenses, like better than a lot of companies, but most of them like uh, Nikon, Canon, and Sony. Sony is very well known for their mirrorless. And the cool thing about them is that like now a lot of the mirrorless, like you can actually have it track an eyeball. So if you're like photographing a dog or a child or a human, it'll just automatically track on the eyeball and keep the eyeball in focus. Wow. Um, so yeah, Sony was- the no more red eyes. That's what you're saying, no more red eyes. <laughs> well, there haven't been red <laughs> eyes for a long time, but no blurry eyes. No blurry eyes, okay. Yeah, and then I just wanted to point out, um, you're looking in the chat, there's also a Q and A window and Did I miss uh, it? Oh. Kardika is asking oh. a couple of questions over there. You're right. Thank you for catching mm -hmm. that. Because I was catching the one as it was people were coming mm -hmm. in and doing it. Right. So Kartika is asking, I'm interested in starting an online business like a subscription-based website. Mm -hmm. When is the right time to register a company name and where should we start? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would register a name immediately like this thing that I'm... I mentioned earlier that I'm not really telling anybody about. Yeah. I already have it on all social media platforms. I've already like started the trademark process in the States um, or while well, I'm about to. So in terms of business names, I'd do it immediately if you know what you want it to be because then other people can't snag it. And to start on that, um, in terms of registering it, you can actually do that at the Small Business Center small at business the City Center. Halls or online. Exactly. Yep. Um, and when you're asking where should we start, I'm wondering if you're meaning in terms of registering or finding a business name. I suspect then, it's, it's there, like what you're saying, like to go register, to the small yeah. business center and they'll help you with everything. Yeah. yeah. And then she said, you mentioned you built your own website right. in your early days. Um, was there any services you outsourced even before generating much revenue? any other early days experiences to share with us today? So in terms of outsourcing before much revenue, um, no. <laughs> I know I'm you always... said, uh, yeah, you said that you have an accountant that helps you now, but they probably in the early days, you were doing all that stuff yourself too, I bet, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So there's, I will say this has been a company that I've been sponsored by in the past, but they only sponsored me because I told so many people about it because it's such an incredible company. Um, it's called 17 hats and they were not there when I started, but I wish that they were. And if you just look up 17 hats.com, um, they, they called it 17 hats because it does like all the different things that small business owners have to do. So they have accounting built into it. That's how I manage all of my client emailing. Um, like all the workflows are automated, everything like that. And so that's a really great resource when somebody's starting out because they, I think they might have a free version uh, for people who just want to like have a couple of clients in there, but it's a really good place to start instead of having to outsource. Um, yeah, I did all my own websites. The very first one I built like using HTML in Dreamweaver, which I don't even know if Dreamweaver exists anymore. Um, I did. A, I used to manage websites in Dreamweaver. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And if you do go to 17hats.com, I see she shared it there in the chat um, and you want to try it out. I have a code, Hannah Marie. You can just use my name with no spaces. And um, I think that'll save you a bunch of money or something. I don't know what it is now. I haven't looked into it, but it'll save you something. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a great resource because it prevented me from having to outsource a lot. So basically um, within that, I could again, like do all my workflows. It has contracts where people can sign contracts. You can do questionnaires. You can do a whole bunch of things in there. Um, and in terms of online businesses, I would actually recommend looking up a, a guy named James Wedmore. I follow him on Instagram and listen to his podcast. And he's excellent at like um, helping people, not so much in the beginning phases, but like still like he teaches online businesses and like how to build out your your sales page and things like that um he's a really great resource for that great mm -hmm. good advice and there are there are a lot of website companies um i currently use one called show it but the one that i'm going to shift everything over to is called webflow and it's a newer one and it's kind of like they don't use uh, WordPress. They use a new system that apparently is gonna be even better for SEO and is more updated. And they have a lot of like website templates that you can just pull out and use. So that's kind of one way of outsourcing is just getting a website and then customizing the words on it. And then the other thing I would say is businessmadesimple.com. Uh, no, wait, that's wrong. Business Made Simple University, if you just Google that. I forget what the URL is, but there's a fellow named Donald Miller who wrote a book called Building a Story Brand. It's an excellent book. That's what I've used for all of my marketing messaging. And he has a podcast called Business Made Simple. They have a podcast called Marketing Made Simple. And Business Made Simple University is basically like all of the books they've written, they also have online courses for. So it has like everything you would ever need as a business owner. I feel like um, they just launched one for finance. Um, yeah, I could talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. All the different. You, yeah. You, you the one other book I would recommend is by Mike Michalowicz and it's um, Profit First. So you were talking about like before you had revenue. I really believe that like the first time you get paid you can be profitable and that's through like his profit first system so cool that's well it. <laughs> i'm sure that uh you probably you know for the folks that are on the call today and if they have more questions i'm sure that they yeah. can reach out to you for any more advice that Definitely. you might have but you've shared a lot of really great ideas and resources tonight so i think uh, now megan correct me if i'm wrong we're turning things over to madison to talk about simply analytics and how that works and what a great resource that that is that we have through the library as well to help businesses that are starting out or maybe somewhere in between like where Hannah is right now that uh, can get data to help support their business plan. So we'll turn that over to you folks now. Well, thanks thank so you, much. Hannah. It was lovely to chat with you tonight. You too. Thanks so much, Tracy and Hannah, for an excellent conversation and uh, to our folks who are participating tonight for some awesome questions. Um, we really appreciate both of your time and our participants' time as well. Um, Madison is going to come on to talk about Simply Analytics, uh, and I don't think I need to do an introduction because Tracy just, just told us a little bit about it, and Madison, of course, will tell you a bit more. Um, we are going to go a little bit after 8 o'clock, so if you can hang around, uh, 
you will get some one-on-one -on -one question time with Madison. Um, and we do have a express headshot to give away. So I used a random number generator and the lucky winner is Bryce. Um, I'm assuming that's a child's name. So Bryce, I'm going to send you a chat message and I'll just confirm your email and we'll um, connect you with Hannah Marie to get that headshot session. So congratulations. Okay, Madison, if you are ready to take it away, welcome, welcome. Hello, sorry, I was muted and video off. I couldn't, <laughs> uh, I couldn't get it going. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. All right, and in a second, you can see me. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Madison, um, and I will be presenting Simply Analytics as, um, was it Tracy? <laughs> Tracy and Megan have mentioned. Um, so I used to be in collections development. Um, as a library assistant, where this was a huge part of my role. Um, and I would do business outreach um, for Simply Analytics to a bunch of local businesses, um, to places like the Accelerator Center, Communitech, um, places for startups. I've worked with the Small Business Center, um, so we have some connections there as well. Um, just to promote um, this amazing tool that we have. Um, now I'm currently actually started a new role at Eastside. Um, so we're getting the Eastside branch ready to go. Um, so I'm over there now, but <laughs> just taking a quick jump into my old role um, to fill this presentation. And if you guys have questions, um, even though I'm in my new position, I'm absolutely happy to answer um, any questions and help in whatever way I can. Um, but on this call as well is Miss Penny McGill, who is um, my new uh, I guess my replacement in collections development. So she will be taking over for me. So um, I'm sure she will have contact information for you guys as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so I can get my presentation going. Um, if that is possible, <laughs> it says that it's disabled. I don't know if that's possible, Megan. Try again now. Okay, here we go. Let's share my screen. And I'm going to just share my whole screen because it'll jump around a bit. Oh. Can you guys see my presentation? Is that? Yes, we can see like your slides and everything. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so I'm going to just give you a quick introduction of what Simply Analytics is, um, a little bit where about where the data is pulled from, and then we'll jump right into the heart of it and discover why it's a useful tool. Um, and it's useful for both B2B, so business to business, um, as well as B2C, business to consumer organizations. Um, and we'll take about 20 minutes to look at the solution it solutions it offers and the data and information you can have at your fingertips by using this tool. Um, so we'll briefly go over the accessibility of census data, household spending, Dun & Bradstreet business profiles, as well as PRISM data, which is a really cool and also creepy <laughs> data that we have access to. Um, and I'm gonna use four different tools in the software to try to include as much information as possible. Um, feel free to write questions in the chat as we move along. Um, I believe there's time at the end for questions as well. And of course I will leave my contact information should you have any other questions afterwards or if you need help getting started afterwards as well. Um, and I realized I actually have all of this <laughs> written on my agenda, I'm so sorry. Um, but after questions, we'll wrap things up. And if you have anything um, else to ask, again, just feel free to message or email and I'll leave that information with you. All right, so starting, what is Simply Analytics? Um, it was briefly mentioned, um, but Simply Analytics is a web-based mapping analytics and data visualization program. And it allows you to create interactive maps, charts, and reports using data variables from multiple sources. Um, so what can you access? So some of the sources include um, the census from 2006 to 2016, um, as well as projections. So um, years, of course, 2016 was quite a while ago. Um, and the census data for 2021 is not all out yet, so it's not all updated. Um, but it should be updated by the end of this year. I've gotten confirmation from our Simply Analytics uh, representative. 
Um, so this will include data like population, age, income, housing, um, race and ethnicity. Um, and then again, it'll also include projections and estimates for five years. Um, on top of that, we will have household spending data um, on hundreds of goods and services, as well as business profiles from Dun & Bradstreet for all of North America. Um, so prior to 2022, we only had access to business profiles for Canada. Um, and this year we have acquired access to the US as well. Um, so you can, uh, you can access the business profiles from both. The only thing is everything in Simply Analytics is done by geographic boundaries. Um, so unfortunately, because Canada and US use different geographic boundaries, um, you have to do the searches separately. Um, so I'll show that once we get into actually using the software. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, we will have access to PRISM, which is a premium marketing segmentation system. Um, and it, what it does is it groups Canadians um, into one of 67 groups. And each group has similar lifestyles, spending patterns, settlement preferences, um, the way they think, the way they act, everything like that. And it allows researchers to gain insight into similarly populated communities, which can be then used for target marketing. All right, so what does it allow you to do? So what's great about this data or the software, sorry, is that it allows you to manipulate the data that you have access to. So you can create and export maps, charts and graphs um, of demographic data. You can map businesses by name, by SIC or NAICS codes. Um, and just in case anybody doesn't know, because I did not know <laughs> before I started in this role, um, SIC or standard industrial classification, um, it describes the primary business activity of a company um, and NAICS or the North American industry classification system. Um, it does the same. Um, and it is used in um, Canada, Mexico, and United States. Um, prior to 1987, we used SIC, and then since then we have switched to NAICS, um, but both are still used um, and we have access to both here. Um, so in addition to mapping by SIC or NAICS, you can also view and export business profiles in Excel, CSV, and DMF formats. Um, and this includes amazing information like contact information, access to their website, their address, their sales volume, the number of employees. Um, so it gives you a really good view into what these businesses can do. Um, and then lastly, you can also examine the lifestyle spending patterns and preferences of communities um, to determine ideal audiences for target marketing. And that again is using Prism. So throughout the presentation, I'm gonna show you how you can access and export all of this information um, and we're gonna use different reports in the software so that you guys can get a little bit of a feel of everything. Okay, so where can you access Simply Analytics? Um, of course, as mentioned, you can access Simply Analytics for free through the Waterloo Public Library's digital library. Um, and it is accessible both inside and outside of the library. So I'm gonna click on this digital library link here. So this is the WPL digital library page. Um, if you ever get lost, if you go to the home page, you can see here, it's just this first tab here, digital library, or sorry, second tab. Um, and if you scroll down, everything is in alphabetical order. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see Simply Analytics. Um, and again, it's either inside or outside. I'm currently outside the library. So let's see if it'll let me do this. All right. Um, so once you get into the software, the first thing I recommend you doing is creating an account. So if you click this bottom here um, to create account, you can do that here. Um, I'm just gonna go back, see if it'll let me just go back um, because for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to sign in as a guest. Um, I have many projects on the go in Simply Analytics. Um, so I want you guys to see it as a blank slate so it's not confusing. Um, so I'm just gonna sign in as a guest here. And then once we're in, there's gonna be a little pop-up and I'm just gonna exit right out of it because it's a quick introduction on how to get started. And instead I'm gonna cover that for you. Um, so once we're in, 
as I mentioned, we have access to both Canada and the US. So this is where you would choose that drop down and you would either choose Canada or the US. For this presentation, I'm going to stick with Canada and I'm going to stay super local. Um, so to get started, you need two things. The first thing is a location or multiple locations. Um, so let's start with that. <laughs> Me typing location, Waterloo. So census subdivision, let's look at that. Maybe let's look at Kitchener. And I'm gonna again, look at census subdivision. I'm gonna just put in Ontario because maybe we wanna compare on the provincial level. And then lastly, I'm gonna just try to show you 35 Albert Street, Waterloo. And as you can see, it's saying um, there's no location found, but you can try an address search. So if we click address search, it's gonna show you all of the areas this address falls into from largest to smallest. So it's in Canada, Ontario, Waterloo. And if you continue down to the very bottom, the last one is dissemination area. So Simply Analytics uses all formal census geographic boundaries. Um, so you can enter in, or you can enter a province or um, forward station area, um, but the smallest area is a dissemination area. So that's relatable to the size of a small neighborhood. Um, so if you would like to look at a, your address or a specific address, the closest you can get is the dissemination area it's in. So if you type that um, area or location into the search and do what I did there, you'll be able to choose the dissemination area. So the next thing you need to get started, the second thing is data. Um, so this is the data that automatically pops up. Um, it's auto-populated for you. You are welcome to change data here if you'd like. I always go ahead and click create project because once you're in here, um, you have access to this um, blue box over here called the data block. And that is where it's so much easier to add whatever data it is that you are looking at or whatever data you would like to look at. Um, so I'm not gonna get into the full logistics of how um, all of the preferences and changing the legend or anything like that. But what I am gonna show you just so that you understand what you're looking at is just point out this top bar here. So right now we are looking at, this is the data variable. So the total population of 2021 in Waterloo, and it's currently divided by census tracts. So we could change that to dissemination areas. Maybe we want it a little smaller and you can see how it changes on the map and it divides it in a different way. Um, and perhaps maybe you wanna look at Kitchener instead and you can do that too, um, whatever you'd like. So I'm just gonna go back to Waterloo here and we're going to just jump quickly back to the presentation. All right, so exploring different views um, in Simply Analytics. So as mentioned, there are tools for both B2B um, and B2C organizations. Um, so the first thing we're going to cover is the B2B side of things. Um, so we're going to start by looking up um, stuff in the business block. So in the business block, you have the ability to search and map businesses by keyword, SIC, or NAICS code. Um, you can perform advanced searches to attain more specific results. Um, so this is things like you can um, search SIC, you can choose a specific area, you can add a sales volume, number of employees, and you can limit it all in one search so that it's super specific to what you're looking for. Um, you can also access contact information, sales volume, number of employees um, in all of Canada and the United States. And of course, um, you can export all of these all of these business profiles that you find in um, Excel, CSV, and DMF formats. Sorry, I'm just trying to see if it is possible. I just need to move this guy down because the top bar is blocking <laughs> my... Um, my ability to switch to my other tab. Is there a way to hide that? <laughs> there should be a little arrow that you can press near it and it'll flip it to the bottom, um, the control screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Oh, here we go. Thank you. All right, so jumping back into it, um, so the first thing we'll do is add a business. So if we click on this business block here, you can search businesses by name or type. So for example, if I just type in the word engineer, 
what it's going to do is map anything that has to do with engineering in all of Waterloo. Um, so what I can do here from, oops, sorry, from this screen, you can see the mapped and along the right hand side, you can see now we have this new block that's popped up called businesses. So if I click on businesses, it's going to automatically populate a chart with all of that information in it. So you're going to have company name, the address, where it is, postal code, phone number, if you want to contact them, um, and you can scroll through there. But maybe you're looking for something more than this. And again, I'm just <laughs> going to move this guy to the top so I can scroll over. Um, we can see further down, you can see the sales volume as well. You can see the year it was started, the number of employees, et cetera. Um, if we click view actions and click columns, this is going to show you everything you have access to. So maybe you want to search their websites to get a better idea about what they have to offer. Maybe you want to contact the primary contact about new positions or networking. Um, and maybe you want to make sure you know the primary contact's proper title so you address them properly. And when you click out of there, you'll see that those um, that information has been added. So the primary contact, primary contact title. And if you scroll back over, the URL is there as well. Um, the other way you can do this, um, if we go back to this business block here, you can click browse by business categories. And this is the um, SIC or NAICS code that I was talking about. So maybe you know exactly what it is. You can type in the number um, or you can work your way through the categories. But again, if you'd like, um, you can switch to whatever you'd like there. And then in this bar, um, I'm gonna pretend for this example, I'm looking for something a little bit more specific and I'm looking for uh, robotics and automation. Um, just by typing robot, I can click automation and robotics. And again, just in Waterloo, and just like that, you have that chart ready to go. Um, so if I click export and I'm gonna click Excel export, and let's see how fast we can get this guy open. And just like that, it's in your Excel um, and you can manipulate it however you'd like. Um, so that's one side of the business log. And then the other thing that you can do um, is a advanced search. Um, so for example, let's see, let's try um, looking up the SIC, I have one written down here. So I'm gonna say for this example, we're a legal software company and we are looking specifically for law firms that have at least 10 employees um, and make at least $2 million. And we're gonna check all of Ontario for this one. So we're looking at 811-9902. Um, so we're going to click that one, and then we're going to add the condition of, what did I say, 10 employees. So we want at least 10 employees, and we want a sales volume of 2 million. And we're going to click search. So you can see in just Waterloo, there's four. And you can scroll down and see what their actual sales volume and employees are. So their employees are listed here, sales volume is beside but maybe you're looking for a broader stream. So like I said, Ontario, so you can search all of Ontario and now you have 251 results. And again, everything here that you're looking at, if you just click this export button, um, you can save it in whichever format you'd like um, and you can manipulate it and do what you'd like to it. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation now and we're gonna move on to the next, um, the next view. So the next one that we're going to cover is the comparison report. Um, and like it says on the slide, it allows you to compare any of the data that we have access to. Um, as well, it allows you to compare number totals and average percentages of multiple data variables across multiple regions at, um, regions at once. Um, and you can create and com export these this table as well, again, in all of the formats mentioned. If we go back to Simply Analytics, we're gonna click comparison table. So you can see those are the three data variables that were automatically added at the beginning. And these are the locations that we added at the beginning as well. And it includes Canada. So from here, you can add 
any location and any data variables that you would like, and you can compare all of them. Um, so what I'm going to do, maybe let's look at, um, let's say I want to look at the Spanish population um, in, um, in Waterloo. So maybe I wanna look specifically at the percentages um, in all of Waterloo. So we're gonna add everything that's a percentage. Let's just add the, the amount as well. And we're gonna click out of here. And just like that, all of those data variables have been added to the table. Um, and you can compare among different locations, but maybe as you can see, these uh, data variables from the beginning are no longer um, relevant. So if we click view actions and edit view, we can unselect these, um, hit done. And perhaps we also wanna look um, maybe a little bit further. So let's click locations on the top left and we're gonna add Cambridge census subdivision as well. Oops, Cambridge Bay, I guess instead. Um, let's add Cambridge. It's a little bit more relevant to what we're looking at. And you can drag this over so it's beside the other tri-cities there. Um, so just like that, all of this data and all of these locations are added to a chart. Super simple, super fast. Um, so this is something that's really good for looking at demographics of a specific area, um, anything that you'd like to compare. Um, it's super quick and super easy to put in a table. And then again, of course, you can hit export and it will be easily exported for you. Um, the next thing we're going to cover, let's jump back to the PowerPoint here. The next thing we're going to cover is the ranking report. Um, so what's cool about this one is it allows you to analyze and rank multiple data variables of smaller geographic units within a larger boundary. So for example, you could look at all of the dissemination areas in the larger city of Waterloo. Um, and again, you can create and export a map of this in PNG, JPEG, SVG, or PDF formats. So if we go back into Simply Analytics, and we're gonna click the ranking report here, um, I'm going to go ahead and remove some of these. So we're going to just look at, let's just look at income. So like I showed you before, you can click view actions and edit. Alternatively, if you click on the data that you want to get rid of, you can remove this from the report. And again, we're going to remove that one from the report as well. So we're just looking at income. And instead of census tracts, so again, up here, you can see what we're looking at instead of census tracts, I wanna look at dissemination areas because I want it to be the smallest, most precise possible. Um, so let's say in this example, um, I want to find the highest earning income um, or the highest earning income dissemination area. Um, so the dissemination area where people make the most amount of money. So what you can do is click on the data and sort it largest to smallest. And you can see now that the highest income is 223, uh, 133.38. Um, and that is dissemination area 0582. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know my dissemination areas off the top of my head. Um, and that's okay. We can click on the income. And if you click create map, it is gonna show you exactly where it is. Um, and that engineering example from before is still showing up on our map. So I'm just gonna exit it to stop the confusion. So when you look here, it's a little confusing because it says it was the highest income, but when you look here, it's a very light pink. So it should in theory be dark red. And that's because if you can look at the top, it's households by income in dissemination area, but then it's sorted by census tracts. So you need to make sure that you're looking at that. And we're gonna change that to dissemination area. And then it makes more sense, it's back to that dark red color. So if we go back to ranking, um, maybe we want to look quickly at um, the lowest earning area. So this only has the top 100. And if you go to the bottom, you'll see that we have 100. So that's because there's more than 100 dissemination areas in Waterloo. So I'm gonna change this to the top 1000 so we can have all of them in this list. And then if we scroll to the bottom, and we have dissemination area 0298. 
um, with an extremely smaller income than the first one we looked at. So if we click on that and create map, you will see this makes a lot of sense <laughs> because students live in this area. Um, and students, a lot of students aren't working full time. They're only working part time or not at all. Um, so of course the income in this area when you average it out is gonna be a lot smaller than others. Um, so that just shows you a little snapshot of how you can use um, the ranking report. So we're gonna go back into the presentation again and we're gonna cover the last and most exciting thing to me, which is the related data table um, where we can compare all of the data we have, so including census data, demographic estimates, demographic trends, household spending, as well as PRISM data. Um, and that's what we're gonna focus on. Um, so in this, uh, this report, if you choose one data variable, all related data will automatically be added to the table. So for example, if you want to look at the percentage of households with the income of 50,000 to 75,000, the report is automatically gonna add all of the other income ranges as well for you to compare. Um, so as I mentioned, we are gonna use PRISM to, to look at this example. Um, and PRISM consists of 67 segments that capture demographics, lifestyle, consumer behavior, settlement patterns, and it highlights key demographic trends. Um, it allows you to get inside the mind of your target um, allow you to understand what consumers are buying, what they're doing, what they're thinking, which allows you to anticipate their marketplace behavior. Um, and before I jump back into Simply Analytics to actually show you, I just want to quickly show you the metadata sheets that they use to classify consumers so you know um, the value of the information you're getting. So if we click this PDF here, I'm just going to go into the first segment, which is the A-list. Um, so you can see this is the metadata sheet. So it is saying um, there are wealthy couples and families in stately homes. So for example, they live in Toronto's Bridal Path, um, Calgary's Apple Mont Royal, Elbow Park, Montreal Westmount. Um, they have children ranging from 10 to 25. They live in the lap of luxury, easy, to, easy commute to downtown um, for arts and entertainment. They have university education. Um, a lot of them with bachelor's or graduate degrees, executive positions in business management, real estate, um, easily afford their multi-million dollar houses where they have garages that shelter multiple imported luxury cars, pillars of the community, um, philanthropists who support local charities, um, and they volunteer as well. They appreciate marketing messages that appear to appeal to their individuality. Um, they have it all. They have high incomes, advanced degrees, sophisticated tastes. They like theater and opera, classical music. They're very active. They like to go running and they like to play golf. They hire personal trainers. Um, they eat organic and gluten-free. Um, they love to travel. Um, they're average internet users, but they are tech savvy um, and they use their computers to consult consumer reviews, to listen to podcasts, et cetera. Um, so you can see, they, uh, so some have achieved a net worth approaching $5 million with they use financial planners. They re remain loyal to traditional media. Um, so a lot of them like to peruse daily newspaper um, as well as magazines. It also includes a section here about how they think. Um, so they have the values that typically define successful people they're willing to take risks and adapt to life's uncertainties. Um, they feel an obligation to help others. They also recognize that other cultures have a great deal to offer. Um, they look for eco-friendly products. Despite their obvious wealth, they're keen to impress others with their material possessions. Um, and in the market, they gravitate towards brands they see as authentic. Um, and then if you scroll down to the next page, it also just has a smaller snapshot here of things they like how they live. So the leisure, shopping, traditional media, financial, et cetera, as well as a little, um, a little description of their attitudes. Um, so for example, I'm less guided by my emotions, feeling, or intuition than by reason and logic. Um, so this is just to give you a, a snapshot to see 
what we have the access to. And again, like I said, there's 67 of these. So it's quite a lot of reading, but it's pretty interesting to look at how they've been separated. So we're going to go into simply analytics now and we're going to apply this. So the ranking report, um, if we go into new view, um, so at the top on the right hand side, and we're going to scroll down or sorry, not ranking, we're looking at related data table. Um, so we're going to go over to this one here, related data and click create. And what I'm going to do, because it's going to pull up all of this data that's related, I'm going to just reduce this right away to just Waterloo because it's already going to be a lot to see. So I'm going to click done. So as you can see, the number, the, the data that was already selected was total population. And all of these data variables also have to do with population. So they have been added to this chart as well. We don't want to look at population right now. I want to look at Prism. So we are going to click data. And instead, we're going to go to data folder. So just so you know, when you go into the data, um, data bar here, you can either keyword search, go by category, which is where we were, or data folder. It's all the same data. It's just laid out a little bit differently. Um, for this, it's a little bit easier to go into the folder. And what I want to look at is how they've been segmented. So I'm going to click segments households, and I want to look at the percentage. So here's where if I click percentage of A-list and click out of here, it's automatically adding all of the other percentages because they're related. So while that's populating, let's see. All right, so you can see it's already changed from highest percentage to lowest. Um, so if we click on the highest percentage, again, we can click create map. I'm gonna just get rid of engineer again. <laughs> and again, you can look at census tracts or if you'd like it a little bit smaller dissemination areas. And then you can see where those groups of people live. So if you're looking at those data sheets and you are reading through and you find the perfect audience for what you'd like to market, um, I'm just gonna go back. So let's just jump into this one really quickly. And we're gonna go into the very bottom to the data sheets. Again, so this has the description of who they are. I'm not gonna go through and read this one like I did the last one, um, but let's just say I have, so let's see, they're really into professional sporting events. So maybe I have some sort of app about tracking sporting events, who knows? So now this um, segment five is the people I want to contact by clicking on that percentage, creating a map. I'm just showing you one more time and I'm gonna change it to dissemination areas. You can see these dark red areas would be the areas you would focus your marketing to. Um, from there, if we go to, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. again, sorry, the, I'm just gonna exit this here. Um, if we want to name this just up here on the top, I'm going to do this uh, practice and hit enter. Um, so now the project is named. So if you click on open project, you'll see practice is there. And then once you've completed that and you maybe want to do a new search, you can just click on new project and we're right back at the beginning. So that concludes everything I wanted to show you guys. Um, I guess now would be a great time <laughs> for questions. Um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen and I hope you have learned a lot and you enjoy what you've learned. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen um, and I will let Megan <laughs> do her, do her business. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Madison, for all of that information. It always wows me and terrifies me at the same time, but it <laughs> is an amazing tool, uh, especially if you are considering a business or making some sort of change in direction in your business. It's a great opportunity to consult that and it's free at the library. Um, so definitely check it out if you if that's something that interests you. Um, if anybody has any questions, we are well over time. So thank you for those who did stay. Um, if you do have questions, you can feel free to email me after and I can, oh, here, Hannah Marie is asking, is it only <laughs> available for Canada or can it do the US too? 
No, U.S. as well. So um, when you sign in, the first thing that's going to pop up is the location selection. And above the, the location search bar, there's a little toggle um, with a drop down menu where you can select USA instead. Um, and the only reason that you can't do both at the same time is because the geographic boundaries are different. Awesome. No problem. <laughs> great question. Love it. <laughs> um, but if I don't see any others, I think that's great. Um, awesome. As I was saying, you can email me and I will pass those questions on to Madison and or Penny, who is also here with us on the call. Um, both are experts of Simply Analytics. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So thank you everyone for joining this evening. This was our second part of our Bold Business uh, series. We're going to take a pause over the summer and then hopefully we'll be back in the fall with some other excellent um, local members of our com business community here. So thanks again. And I hope everyone has an excellent Wednesday night. Take care. <laughs>